Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. My name is Sue Lawrence, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Prue Leith to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Um, first of all, Prue, um, you're not usually like this. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, you know what? If you're my age, you shouldn't jump. <laughs> Okay. I've, I've bust my Achilles tendon, that's what I've done. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to say that this event is sponsored by the absolutely wonderful National Library of Scotland. I also have to, at this stage, remind you please to put your mobile phones off. But if you'd like to tweet, um, if you don't mind doing that when the lights are fully up, uh, when we're open to questions from the floor. Um, so to introduce Prue, who needs no introduction, um, as you know, for Shall we, can we say nearly 60 years? Prue has been so, yeah. very influential in Britain's food scene as a caterer, restaurateur, teacher, cookery writer, and of course, TV star. She's also written eight hugely popular novels. And now, for the first time in 25 years, God. she has published her first cookbook. So, to start off with, through the very, very obvious question is, why now? What's, what's happened? <laughs> well, when I last wrote cookbooks, um, I had my catering company and my restaurant and, and cookery school, and so I was right in the thick of the food world. And when I had this idea that I had to write novels, I realized I couldn't do that unless I stopped writing cookery. And so I did. And I sold the business and I wrote. And then what happened was I started to do television again. And I was on the Great British Menu and then Bake Off and so on. And I realized just how much food has changed and how we've all changed the way we eat and, and how much more exciting food is now. And in the old days, my cookery books were very reliable, very classical, but they were mostly written for for chefs or for um, home cooks who were learning to cook because I had a cookery school so it was, right, this is classic quiche Lorraine and the only way you do it is this way and it was very exact and prescriptive. Whereas today's cooking is not like that, is it? I mean, people have wonderful ingredients and they combine things in the most creative and imaginative way and people share platters more and, and we were far more receptive to spices and to... Um, Middle Eastern cooking and all sorts of other influences. And so I thought I'd love to get back into that. And I started stealing recipes from the, from the chefs in Great British Menu. And but then crediting them always. Yeah, just, <laughs> just, just nicking them. And, then, and the same with the bakers. I mean, they are so creative. And, so, and then I suddenly realized I had this pile of recipes, mostly not mine, but I thought I'd better um, use them for inspiration. So, but, I but there's I'll lots of lovely ones. For example, from your South African childhood, there's Boboti, yeah. which is wonderful. Yeah. There are some old-fashioned classics in there too. I mean, there's, you know, there's a tart normande which I've been cooking and demonstrating for 50 years, pretty well, and um, and a, a few sort of classic things, long, slow roast um, lambs and things. But a lot of them are quite quick and easy, you know, done in half an hour and very colourful and light and healthy and so mm. forth. Much more veggie stuff in there than there used to be in my old days. So it was really because I couldn't not do it. Mm. And you write an introduction that um, you are absolutely fine about using packet of stock cubes, frozen puff pastry. Yeah. I think you said frozen mash as well. Yeah, frozen And mash that your frozen. friends Tut tut are shocked. So, well, but do we need to go to back to basics, or you know, there's you so know, many I'm, good I'm shortcuts. If I've got time and I've got potatoes, in the, in, I will make mash. I love making mash. Mm -hmm. It's really satisfactory, and I've got a m good machine to mash it, so it's fine. Um, I just think you shouldn't be snobby about these things. I mean, there's some dishes that I swear you would not know if somebody had used. Um, bought frozen, good quality butter puff pastry, or had made it themselves. In fact, very often, let's face it, the bought one is better. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes when you make it yourself, it's too warm, and the butter starts running out, and you get rather greasy pastry, or so on. 
So I'm not a snob about any of these things, but I do love real cooking, so I think you should, you should make bread if you enjoy making bread. These days you can buy very good bread. Oh, I heard of a bread place yesterday um, called Freedom Bread. Do you know about Freedom Bread? It's made by prisoners in Glasgow. Oh, yes, yes. yes. And um, what a good thing to teach mm. prisoners a trade while they're inside and make wonderful sourdough and oh, it's yeah. wonderful. So sometimes you can buy good bread. Yeah, exactly. So any other sort of favorite recipes? I know one of mine is the cottage pie with black pudding and it's oh, got it's a sweet delicious. potato crust. It just sounds delicious, I haven't made it yet. It is, it actually it's quite good with haggis as well. Yes, yes. I think that quite often mince is a problem for people because they don't fry the meat hard enough. If you, if you want to make good mince, you have to not worry about how clean your top is going to be at the end of the, <laughs> end of the frying process. You just go for it and fry it. First of all, you'll get rid of a lot of fat, which is quite good because you don't have to um, mm. drain it all off afterwards. And you will get that lovely flavor of browned meat. Um, and you need richness for mince. So I usually make tons of it at once because I think I'm going to make the kitchen in a mess. Let's make a lot. And then I... You know, and I make it like bolognese sauce. You know, I'll put a garlic and a bit of tomato puree and onions, and I put a bit of black pudding or haggis into it because it just gives it a bit more richness. The classic bolognese, by the way, ha usually, if you look at old-fashioned Italian recipes, it always had a bit of liver in it because liver gives it that richness. Kids don't like liver now, and in schools, if you have shepherd's pie with liver in it, you have to declare it so the children... <laughs> can choose <laughs> to eat it or not. And of course, the result is they don't eat it. So I like that. And then I freeze it, and just in massive quantities, you know, but in, in small flat packs. My big tip is never freeze anything in a ball, because it takes forever to um, thaw, and it takes up too much room in the freezer. If you free freeze it in a plastic bag and push it down flat, and you can pack it, you know, like books. And um, so you just fish out one when you want it. And thaw it by just putting it under cold water, in, let sink it under cold water. And it's thawed in half an hour, mm. and then you make shepherd's pie. Yeah. The, the book is full of also very good tips. I was remembering from the last time we met, you explaining about how to get the seeds out of a pomegranate very easily. Yeah. But, but it's, no, it's brilliant. When you're taking a, a seeds out of a pomegranate, they sort of explode and you get little juice, bits of pomegranate juice all over your apron or your dress. The trick is to do it under water. Put it under the sink and when you, you break open the pomegranate and then you can sort of gently push all the seeds off. And what happens is the seeds sink and the white bits, the maddening bits of pith that you struggle with, mm. float to the top mm. and you can scoop them off. Absolute genius. <laughs> um, so you've obviously taught thousands and thousands of people to cook yeah. over the years. So who actually taught you? Ah, well, I learned to cook at the Cordon Bleu Cookery School. My mother was the worst cook you have <laughs> ever, ever met. So she didn't uh, teach me to cook. I could have learned to cook at... Uh, we, I, was gr I grew up in South Africa, and so I lived a very white, privileged... Um, apartheid era childhood and we had a Zulu cook who cooked for us, Charlie, he was wonderful. And I could have learned to cook in his kitchen, at his apron strings, but it just never occurred to either of my parents or to me that I would ever be a cook. In South Africa, cooking was not something young, posh white girls did. So I never did. And so I didn't l really get into food till I got to Paris and I got enthusiastic about you can't live in Paris for two years and not end up interested in food. <laughs> well, you'd have to have dead taste buds. Exactly. <laughs> yes. yes. So, um, yeah. so I didn't, you know, I didn't learn to cook. I learned it at, at the Cordon Bleu Cookery School. Mm. We had very, it was very classic French cooking we learned, mm. but really good. Um, you say that you're inspired a lot by the French chefs, Paul Bocuse, uh, sadly, no longer with yeah. us, the Roux brothers, um, and even Elizabeth David's books, yeah. Yeah, French sure. cooking it and all the rest of it. So um, are there any, you also admire Jamie Oliver, so bring us up to date, are there any food heroes nowadays? I mean, do we want to mention Jamie or anybody else? Well, Jamie, I, I, I mean, I always call him Saint Jamie. Because, I mean, he is such a good... I mean, to me, he's a boy. I mean, I know he's now a very grown-up chap with 
half a dozen children or something. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I've known him since he was really just a boy when he made when he published his first cookbook, which is called The Naked Chef. And um, he his heart is so in the right place. He always wants to, to do the right thing, and he's tried very hard to teach the nation to cook and and um, communities to cook and children to cook. And he helped me when I was on the school food trust chairing the sort of government quango that was there to help schools do a better job it, in the school dining rooms. Jamie has always been absolutely fantastic. And he's one of the few, if you look at the stats, he's one of the few cooks on television that people actually try to cook from. Mm -hmm. Most cooks, they just watch them for entertainment. And most books are bought, I'm sorry to say, as coffee table books. I mean, they're not bo bought for that, but that's what happens to them. They're beautiful books, wonderful pictures. Mm -hmm. But people cook from, I don't know if it's quite true now, because I'm talking about a few years ago when I read all this, but the two cooks who over the last you know, few decades people have cooked from are Delia Smith and Jamie, mm. because they're reliable, their things work, and they're inspiring. You always yes. want to cook from mm. their stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's turn to other things as well. In your memoir, Relish, you say about writing, for me, it's like a disease, an itch, something I'm compelled to do. You say you've always written poems, journalism, cookery articles, even business reports, yeah. but by far the most satisfying to me are the novels. So when did you start writing fiction and did you find it easy? Um, I, I was worried, I knew because I'd done a lot of journalism by the time I um, sold my business to, to write novels, I knew that I could handle the, the writing, uh, but I was nervous about the plots. Mm. I thought, how will I ever think of the, what these characters are going to do? And so I went off to the Arvon, um, I don't know, many of you will, will be writers, I know, and many of you will have heard of Arvon, but Arvon teaches four-day courses. You can do a four-day course in poetry or in script writing or in, in novel writing, whatever, and I did four days novel writing, and it was so helpful, it was absolutely brilliant. Mm. And um, one of the things they told me was, because they were reading my first novel, which I had just three quarters finished. And the, the woman who helped me said, um, this book stops on chapter 19, and the next four chapters are the sequel. You don't want them, cut them out. And I hadn't realized that. I hadn't realized I'd actually written a novel and it had stopped. <laughs> I mean, it's that thing of the story arc, which I hadn't really realized. I mean, I was just going on with the next bit of their li the characters' lives. So I did find that difficult at first, mm. but I'm better at it now. <laughs> Absolutely, eight books later. So this one, The Lost Son, is just out, and um, I love the way you just very subtly bring in food. I mean, the main characters are cooks and restaurateurs anyway, Always. <laughs> but do you realize that in chapter two, you actually very subtly have a, an entire cheese souffle recipe? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're aware, because I'm, I'm no, looking I at it, and we've got white sauce, we've got cheese, we've got Dijon mustard, paprika. Next page, you're whisking the egg whites. You've got the entire ingredients there. Very well, subtle. It is a problem with me, because I, <laughs> I, I find it impossible not to write about food. And, um, yeah, so it's a nice way of... Because I do actually love writing cookery books, too, mm. and I mean, that's why... You know, the, um, the Prue cookery book mm. has been such a joy. Mm. But I, I do find it difficult not to. But the other thing is I'm quite lazy, so I like to write on what I know about. And so my characters do turn out to be a lot um, cooks. And I have One of my novels has a main character who's a gardener. Mm. She's a gardener. And um, I found that, because I'm very keen on gardening, I did find that... The, the, the novel goes over two years, and so, and the garden, the actual garden is almost like a character because it dominates her life. And I found that I kept finding I was writing a gardening manual, you know, how to, <laughs> how to take cuttings, how to turn the compost out. <laughs> and I, it was much too long, and what I had to take out was all the information. <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes my editor says, look, we don't need to know exactly how no, to No, but I loved it. I thought it, was, I thought it was great. So when you're writing fiction, do you find the process, um, well, not 
it's never easy, but what about writing dialogue, creating plot, developing characters? Which would you say you prefer? I think the most important is the characters. Mm. Um, they really have to be real. Mm. And they do have to have some sort of, I hate this expression, by the way, but they do have to go on a journey. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a revolting <laughs> cliche? But anyhow, they do. <laughs> They, they, so they can't be the same people at the end of the story um, as at the beginning. And, I mean, with The Lost Son, which is my latest novel, it's part of a trilogy. It's, the, it's, it's book three of a trilogy. And the thing that I found really, really hard about writing a trilogy, and believe me, I will never write another, <laughs> it was totally exhausting, is that by the time you get to book three, you have this absolute forest of characters because... You know, you start with one couple, and the first novel is easy to write because it's just the ha their story. But then there are children, and then there are more people, and, and then the next generation stories, and then the next gen So it gets more and more difficult. And remembering, and you know, I'm getting old, so remembering, remembering is not what I do best. And it really was, I had to keep very detailed notes of what color people's eyes were, and how tall they were, and when they, um, ch you know, when they went gray, and mm. Because, I mean, one character, um, who's the main character in the first book, she's in her late 70s in the third book, so she's had a long journey. Um, and so I found that um, a bit difficult. Yeah, but what I loved about this book, it was very helpful. At the beginning, you had the family tree. Oh, yeah. So I kept referring back, which is very useful. Yes, I did rather insist on that, because... Mm. Um, Publishers don't like stuff that's not in the story, you know, they know people just skip the beginning and so on. But I, I thought it was, you know, when I was reading the Cazalet novels, mm -hmm. I, you know, the, um, Elizabeth Jane Howard, I found the family tree really, because she did five novels, so the family tree is really important. Mm. And a little bit in the, this book has the story so far. But, I, but the truth is, they are all standalone novels. I mean, you can't write a trilogy and, and expect people to buy book one and book two. I mean, book, th book three or book two are perfectly good novels mm. by themselves. Exactly. But I mean, I hope that they will be so loved that people go back and r read the prequels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you said once that um, a lecturer on screenwriting said to you that all good writing stemmed from an unhappy childhood. <laughs> and when you told him yours was very happy, he said, either you write bad novels or you're in denial. <laughs> what a terrible you thing to say, and it, it bothered you then. Does it still bother you? It does, and, and it, I mean, I know that is nonsense, mm -hmm. because there are many um, writers who write brilliant books who have not had an unhappy happy childhood. The thing about writing, and I, I'm getting quite worried about this now, because you're all um, readers, so you'll you absolutely understand. There's this great thing going on at the moment about cultural appropriation, that you can't write from a man's point of view if you're a woman. You can't write from a lesbian's point of view if you're not, if you're heterosexual. You can't, you know, the other day I, I was, I wanted to wear a hat, a Mexican sombrero, and my PR lady said, don't tweet it, you'll be accused of cultural appropriation. <laughs> well, hasn't it got crazy that we can't? So I think th this is all nonsense. You can, you, can write as a ma you can write from a man's point of view, you can write from a, somebody else's point of view, but you must really understand that culture. I, I think it's quite correct that if you're writing about um, an Ethiopian, and you've never read anything about Ethiopia, you know nothing about the country, you don't understand anything, well, it's, it's wise not to, because you'll do it badly. But even, I don't see why you shouldn't attempt it. I don't think there's anything, I, I think sometimes political correctness is crazy. Mm. It just goes too far. I'm all for something sensible, and you should not be insulting. Mm. But you have to, Writers now, you know, they have, especially children's writers, the, they have to go through this fantastic process of checking that their book is not going to offend anybody. Well, if you write a book that's never going to offend anybody, it's going to be a very boring book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true. Talking, 
talking about children, so um, in Relish, the, the, the memoir, you talk about um, your time as au pair in France in the early 60s and how you were astonished that when you were having dinner or in lunch, there was no separate children's food. And of course, at that time, South Africa, Britain, we all had the fish fingers and chips or you yeah. know, the normal dinner. And so I wanted to ask you, when you became chair of the School Food Trust in 2007, had things greatly improved by then, vis-a-vis -vis children's food, or in fact deteriorated? I think probably deteriorated, mm. because what happened in the 60s and 70s was there was this idea, which, I mean, I think Harold Wilson was a, a great man in many ways, the main way, may, the main way being that he started the open university. I mean, if it wasn't him, there wouldn't have been an open university, so that's what we should remember. But he also said that the white heat of technology was going to solve all our problems, and that women would be released from the boringness of, of of um, shopping and cooking and washing up and all this housework and stuff because they would be able to, um, technology would provide. You know, if we were going to buy our food from um, manufacturers or we're going to take pills that should provide our nutrition and so on. And I, I remember watching a, a um, program of Tomorrow's World and s uh, the presenter held out a couple of pills and said, you know, this is the future. All your nutrition could be like spacemen. You know, you'd go on, you'd have a little pouch or a couple of pills. And I remember thinking, well, that's my job gone. <laughs> <laughs> and also, what about the pleasure of cooking? What mm. about the delight of working with good ingredients and food and the, and, and the fact that, you know, people can have cooking as a hobby or as a, an interest? In, you know, I, anyway, I'm pretty upset about that. Yeah. And um, I don't know why we're talking about this. Well, I've lost the plot already. The, the, chil the children's, children's food. Yeah, yes, so, children's yeah. Food. so by the time I took over, the, uh, well, uh, it was just when we, uh, I mean, you may know the story, but when, um, when Jamie Oliver, St. Jamie, produced his first television program about school food, which was called School Dinners, and it had the turkey Twizzlers in it, and, mm. you know, really uh, sort of uh, horrific examples of what was going on in some schools. And the next morning, Tony Blair rang up, he was um, Prime Minister, rang up Ruth Kelly, who was then the Education Secretary, and said, um, we've got to do something about that. I never, ever want to see a programme like that again. And Ruth Kelly said, Prime Minister, you will never do anything about it until you change the law about what children can be fed at school. We have to change the law because teachers and head teachers who have stuck up against budget problems will try to raise money any way they can to for the school bus or sports equipment or new computers. And if it means se selling chips and chocolate to children or vending machines or anything else, some schools are making £60,000 a year out of their vending machines. They will do it. So. They formed the School Food Trust, I chaired it, and we did get a lot of good work done. And so, yes, things did get better after that. But we, it, it food before that had degenerated into schools, into cafeterias, kids queuing for hours and, oh, not hours, but kids spending their whole lunch hour, th 20 minutes queuing, um, five minutes eating, and it wasn't a lunch hour at all. They only had, mm. most schools only have a half an hour for lunch. So uh, we did do some good stuff. Unfortunately, in many schools, it's gone backwards because now, um, in England anyway, Scotland, I think, is a bit better. But in England, um, we uh, academies don't have to obey the rules. And so whatever is the rule, mm. which doesn't apply to Scotland anyway. Mm. So I don't know enough about Scotland, but it's, I talk to enough people who are desperately worried that we're not doing enough. Mm. And we're not doing enough. I mean, it is crazy. If you're worried about obesity and you're worried about diabetes and you're worried about all the, the first thing you should think about is what's, what is the main cause of this? And it's lifestyle. Mm. And we should be doing, and government should be doing everything they can to um, and also promote encouraging, healthy And also encouraging children to cook as yeah. well. Yes, because the best way to get children to eat um, healthily is to cook with them and for them to cook because children who cook something always want to taste it. Mm. 
And if they've grown it, they'll they'll eat vegetables. If they've mm. grown a carrot, they're not going. You know, they're going to taste mm. it. I know it's difficult, but it is possible, and it it's it's not rocket science. You know, Finland have been doing this for years. They make cooking is a lesson. It's part of the curriculum. All the children sit down in an old-fashioned way. They eat a healthy meal, three courses, um, or two courses, and they all eat exactly the same thing every day, but it's a different meal every day. They all eat the same meal as everybody else, except for special needs, which mm. they do cope with. Um, but the next day, it's something different, and they and they just do it brilliantly, and it's very efficient, and the, they spend money on the dining room, so it's a pleasant place to be. Mm. They spend money on teaching them to grow food and to cook food, and they spend 8% of the school budget in Finland goes on food education and food eating and lunch. Mm. And they have a terrific record mm. of getting obesity down. That's to aspire to. I want to ask you um, very quickly about the restaurant, which you opened in 1969. Yeah. And initially, you thought it wasn't quite working financially, etc. So in those early days, you asked Chef Alba Roux for advice. And you wrote that when he entered the kitchens, one busy dinner service, he went straight to the bins and sat by the bins. Why? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he did. I thought he'd come and look at my books, you know, and see why I was losing money. I was absolutely packed. I mean, the restaurant was very fashionable. Um, I'd had a lot of publicity, and we were charging quite a lot of money in those days, two pounds, 12 and sixpence it was. And it was a, a four-course meal. And Alba w stood by the bins, and after a while he came in to me, and he said, the two reasons you're losing money, one, you're giving people far too much on their plates, and nobody wants to be overfaced with, you know, a huge plate of food. And secondly, you are your your kitchen staff are just wasting food. So I was pretty indignant about this. Anyhow, we, he plunged his hand into a rubbish bin and he pulled out an apple, and he said, "What is the matter with this apple?" He said, "Why are you throwing it away?" And I took it. I thought, "Oh God, this is too embarrassing," you know. And I took the apple from him and I turned it round, and it was bad. So I thought, oh, thank God, I can. So I said, Albert, I said, that apple is bad. And he said, no, 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 it is only one third bad. And he took a paring knife and he cut the bad bit out and he gave <laughs> And then he pulled out a, you know, watercress used to be bought in bunches with a rubber band around it. And he pulled out this bunch of stalks of watercress with a band on it that the chef had just cut the tops off. And he said, why are you throwing away there? He said, there's more flavor in the stalks and it makes the best soup. Why isn't this good? And he said to me, why are you buying cream in um, great big, you know, demijohns, you know, half gallon mm. pots, um, jars? And I said, Albert, it's cheaper that way. It's only so much a pint or something. And he said, no, no, no. He said, it may be cheaper, but he said, if you give a chef that much cream, he'll go glug, 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 glug <laughs> into the soup. If you give him a tiny little pot, you know, like a half pint pot, he'll take a rubber spatula and he'll scratch the last bit out and he won't waste cream. So he was full of good stuff like that. Love it. Right, so let's turn to Bake Off momentarily. Bake -off. Um, so you wrote that you hoped you'd be chosen to replace Mary, lovely Mary yeah. Berry as judge. But first, just like the contestants, you two had to audition. Tell us about the second edition at Paul Hollywood's house. Mm. Well, the first edition had been um, the, a sort of set up set and I'd had to be with Paul and we judged brownies and scones or something. And I'd obviously got through that and they said, we want you to come down to Paul's house because we want to make sure that the chemistry is working and all that stuff, you see. And by now, I really wanted the job. You know, before I'd been quite sort of, you know, casual about it. I hadn't really realized it was the, the nation's treasure and that it would be <laughs> quite as much you know, drama as I, anyway. So I didn't really mind too much. But once I'd done the first audition, I really wanted it. And so I said to my husband, I know what I'm going to do, because they said that the second audition would be the technical, which I didn't really know what that meant. You know. So I googled it. Uh, go you know, I, w I watched an old episode of Mary and Paul, and I realized that the technical that they, that Paul and Mary sat in front of a perfect something or other and discussed it. 
And so like, they said, well, did I want to choose what the technical would be? So I said, yes, I'll have Gugelhof, which is a, a very um, enriched Austrian cake, and it comes out of a bunt tin, you know, one of those tins that looks like a jelly mold. And um, so I thought, so I said to my husband, I know what I'll do. I will go, I'll arrive at this audition with the most perfect Gugelhof you've ever seen, and they'll be so impressed that I've made the effort <laughs> and that I can really bake, and I, I'm more likely to get the job. So I made one of these things, and I followed some fancy Austrian chef's um, recipe for it, and it had so much fruit and stuff inside, nuts and, and, and rum, inside, you said, and a lot of rum, that when, anyway, it was overladen with fruit, and so when it came out, it just fell to pieces. So I thought, oh, that won't do. So then I made, <laughs> then I got hold of the Leith's recipe, <laughs> got Google off, and did it again, and it came out absolutely beautiful, beautifully, and it was all shiny, and all the definition of the sort of, you know, whirls that come out of a jelly mold type tin. Absolutely fine. So I was quite pleased with this. I said to my husband, come along, come and have a look. And we couldn't cut it or anything because, you know, it had to go whole. And he just walked around it and he just shook his head and he said, it'll never get past Paul Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and what had happened was it had stuck a bit on the edge of the tin. And so when it came out, there was a, you know, sort of brown stuck bit. Well, I would have accepted that merrily, <laughs> but Paul's standards are rather higher. So I never took it, and I never told them. And well, they know now. <laughs> so I put it in the book. <laughs> he knows now. Um, so you wrote that since you're making cakes more these days with Bake Off, yeah. um, you might like to do a baking book. Any plans? Well, you know, we. Uh, I was going to do a baking book with my um, niece, who is that was the head. She now stopped because she's having a baby, but she's the head pastry chef for the Ivy Group. So she's mm. quite powerful um, and very, very good baker, rather, I'm ashamed to say, rather better than me. So we thought we'd do a baking book. But there are so many baking books that we decided, actually, we'd do a veggie book mm. instead. It's got a huge amount of baking in it, yeah. but it's all vegetarian, so all the, um, but it's not coming out till next spring, so we'll bore you with that next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lovely quote, again, from your memoir, saying, and you talk of the novelist Julian Barnes, and he said to you that he didn't have enough evenings left in his life to waste one on a bad bottle of wine and that you feel exactly the same about food. So do you think that in Britain we're still too often accepting food that's bad or at least yeah. mediocre? Yes. Just saying, yes, I it's did. fine, and eating I it. Really, yeah. I really believe this so strongly that because the power for improving anything is always, this sounds like a sort of socialist um, tract, is always with the people, but it is. I mean, if you want to get, the, if, if you want your supermarket to get better at something, you have to moan at them until they do. Mm. And I mean, I must say, food has got so much better recently that it's not quite such a problem about ingredients. But you still go to cafes and restaurants where they just haven't tried and it's just not good enough. Mm. And we're such a hopeless nation about, um, and I think the Scots are even worse than the English of this, about not complaining. I mean, mm. you do need to complain. And um, I mean, you don't have to do it rudely or upset anybody, but you can just say, look, that really wasn't good enough mm. and it's too salty and could the chef taste it or something. Because I think, I honestly believe that Julian's remark about wine is so true. If you, why waste, uh, why waste a single opportunity to eat on bad food? If you're, I mean, I, I'm always saying it's not worth the calories or it is worth the calories. And I think like that because, you know, we all love eating. Being hungry is one of the joys of life. And if you're hungry and you're going to eat something, lovely. So why eat rubbish? Just, you know, it does, can be a sandwich, but it must mm. be a good sandwich. Mm. And, you know, if you're going to eat ice cream, for goodness sake, let's have decent ice cream. Mm. So on. <laughs> Mind you, my husband is mad about Mr. I'm not allowed to say the word. <sighs> Ice cream. <laughs> is it, is it loves whipped? It. Is it whipped lightly? <laughs> he loves it. And he'll eat any ice cream. He has an ice cream radar on his head. He says, uh, when, I when I first met him, he said, um, oh, let's have an ice cream. And I said, oh, I, you know, I don't eat ice cream. It's too sweet, too much sugar, and you know, too fattening. 
And so he bought himself a huge great ice cream and he always says that it, when his back was turned, I put my tongue out and he said, I've got a wolfhound's lick, <laughs> which <laughs> demolished his ice cream. <laughs> and he also says that since I've known him, which is, I've only been married to him for three years, but he says that he is responsible for, for my going down market. He said, I used to be quite posh and now I drink beer I eat ice cream and I wear lots of vulgar colours. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all his fault. <laughs> well, that's actually a nice one because uh, before I open up the discussion to the audience, one final question from me. So I read that your hobbies are gardening, fishing, travelling and trying to get older women to wear bright colours and funky jewellery. How's that going? <laughs> that is going very well. This is my, this is my, this is my, oh, you're a lovely lady because you've, you've fallen into a trap. Yeah. <laughs> Any good optician mm -hmm. will sell you Prue Leith's glasses. And they are multicolored and they are wonderful and you can buy them. So that's the plug. Uh, but the truth is that I have. Since I've been on television, far more like on the Great British Menu and on now, I have had so many people saying to me, I love your glasses or I love your necklaces and so on. And there's such a businesswoman in me. I mean, it's just ever since I've sold my, uh, my own business, which was, you know, I, I was employing 500 people when I sold it. So it was a big catering company and restaurant company and cookery school. And when I sold the lot to write novels, I really missed the business angle. So now I'm into um, fashion, <laughs> if you can call it that, you know, sort of rather vulgar necklaces and vulgar <laughs> necklaces, and, and they wouldn't like, you know. And why not? Posh glasses. <laughs> Posh glasses, exactly. Posh glasses. Right, so I think it's a good time to put the lights on and ask whoever's got the microphones to go around. If I could ask you all, please, ladies and gentlemen, to wait till you've got the microphone actually in front of you. So if you want to start putting hands up, and I can point to uh, somebody... Right there, please, for the first question. Thank you. I think I'll try and get more even, because I always feel sorry for, you know, <laughs> sorry about my back. <laughs> so, first question. We can't hear you. <laughs> Prue, do you want some water, by the way? Because oh yeah, you can't reach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, quick change of microphone. And if whoever wants to do next can get their hand up, and fantastic. We'll go for that one next, yeah. right? Yes? So um, you obviously get to taste some of the most amazing food from the best chefs in the world. Um, but do you ever think, just, you know, stuff it, I really want a deep-fried Mars bar? <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know what? My husband might have taken me down market, but not that down <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yes? What's your favourite colour to wear on your glasses? Ah, do you know, I don't have a favourite because I think specs, and indeed necklaces, but more than anything <coughs> specs, should be like um, shoes or handbags. They should go with what you're wearing. And if you think about it, where do your shoes and your handbags mostly live? They're mostly under the table or in the cupboard. They, they spend very little of their lives being seen, whereas specs are on your face all the time. Mm. So I think um, we should generally be a bit, um, we just transfer the budget from handbags and shoes <laughs> to glasses and necklaces. Because everyone wears And them. earrings, <laughs> glasses and necklaces and <laughs> earrings. Next one, please. Mm. Can somebody get the microphone? Over there, thank you. <coughs> and over this side for the next question. Yes, you get the microphone there. Okay, over here first, please. Thank you, Prue. Uh, what do you think is the most challenging bake anybody could ever face? Oh, my goodness. Um, the most challenging bake. God, I can't think. My mind's got a complete... What, what, was, the, what was the vegan one? Because that was quite a challenging week, wasn't it? Uh, yes. But I, can't I mean, remember. anything, any vegan, any vegan bread is even more difficult. Cake, yeah. vegan cake, well, actually, vegan cake is difficult too, but, but vegan bread, I have never had a decent... Now, I hope somebody will come up and tell me that they've got, they know where <laughs> I give a, a decent vegan loaf. I think, you know, it's just so difficult. 
also um, gluten-free loaves are pretty dreadful too. Mm. Um, it's a pity because, you know, th these are serious, these are not complaints that people make up um, and we ought to be able to do better. But at least you with cake, you can make a good um, flourless cake and mm. good vegan cake. You can Absolutely, make. yeah. yeah. And th one over there, thank you. Prunes, what's your um, very favourite go-to recipe that never fails? Um, <laughs> I think probably the River Cafes, actually this is um, gluten-free, the River Cafes polenta cake, which is polenta and lemon. And it is absolutely brilliant. It's just a classic polenta cake with a ton of lemon in it and ground almonds, and it's, it's just wonderful. It always works because if you, um, if you undercook it, it's like pudding, but it's divine pudding. And if you overcook it, it's perhaps a little bit dry, but you know, a bit of lemon curd sauce on it would be fine. Hmm. Can't fail. <laughs> Better than fine. <laughs> yes. uh, we have one question here, please. Yes. Um, if, do you have any advice for if a bait goes wrong and then you don't really know what to do? It depends what the bait is, obviously, but you shouldn't, uh, I mean, th it's very rare that you need to tip something in the bin. Nearly all cakes, can be hugely imp improved by a ton of custard. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my advice. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Got a question over here, thank you. Hi, you said earlier you weren't snobby about shop-bought pastry or something like that. What are you snobby about? <laughs> ah. um, I'm really snobby about um, ketchup. I think it's really easy to make a great tomato sauce that is just tastes at the same time tomato and fresh without tasting like bottled ketchup. Um, Does that happen to I'm in your novel? Very your snobby <laughs> about, I'm really snobby about sauces that are thickened with corn flour. I will use a bit of corn flour quite often to thicken a sauce, but it should only be so that it just thickens it a little bit. But you know when you go to a pub, and they've bought everything in. And you know, some of the um, stuff that's bought in is really good. You know, it's, it's consistent and it's been well thought out and it's a proper recipe. But then they have this sort of industrial brown sauce in the back there and it's thickened with corn flour and it is like a sort of brown goo that goes on. So I'm a real snob about that. Mm, understandable. I think up there was next. Oh, then sorry, over here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. First one over here. Yes. Uh, Prue, in your position uh, as um, in the media or television, how would you address food waste, which is a huge issue? Well, it's all over. Well, it's all over the world. Issue. Providing food out of season, and obviously, when we go on to the vegetarian side, you have to have food from all over the world to satisfy that market. Yeah. Is it sustainable? Of course not. It's not sustainable. And I do absolutely agree with you that there's a huge problem with food waste. And it's rather, it's not just food, to be honest. We have got such a throwaway society at the moment. We think nothing of, um, you know, buying cheap clothes, which we wear two or three times and dump them. And I'm of the generation because I was, I mean, I was born in 1940. So that was just in the middle of the war and well, in the war beginning of the war. So I grew up in austerity times, and so I find it really hard to throw anything away. In fact, my husband is often asked, you know, oh, you must have wonderful food because you're married to Prue Leaf. And he says, actually, I live on leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some truth in that because I cannot throw stuff away. I do remind him that we, we would, if we didn't have some prime cooking going on, there wouldn't be any leftovers. <laughs> so, but I do think that we are, crazy the way we eat and I'm really I actually um, I'm a board member of this of the sustainable restaurants association which tries to get chefs to stick to um, um, British ingredients in season and um, to, to do more dishes that are vegetarian or more dishes that the prime ingredient isn't vegetarian you know there's so many delicious things you can do without having great slabs of meat in front of you and I really believe that one of the 
ways that we can A, help the planet and B, help our health, is to buy really good, good quality meat when we buy meat, but only buy it you know, twice a week or something. Less meat, better quality is a really good mantra mm. because it'll taste better, it's more healthy for you, it's not cruel to animals and um, there's less waste. Mm. Yeah, you're a second. Uh, one up there, please. No, okay, yep. I read last week that uh, Edinburgh has more restaurants per head than any other. I'm here. Oh, you're there. Yep, here. Yes, no, we moved. Edin Edinburgh has more restaurants per head than any other uh, city in uh, Britain. <coughs> in your time, uh, both running a restaurant and since, has it become easier or harder to open a restaurant, and why? It's become much harder to open a restaurant because there's much more competition and because rates have gone up so high. I mean, it's really difficult now to, you know, everybody's always, the, if you want to have a successful restaurant, the best place to open it is where there are other restaurants. Where there are other restaurants is where the rents are high because that's been a popular area or something. And so, yeah, it's much more difficult. And also, habits have changed. What happens now is that people go to a new restaurant. It's the flavor of the month. It's a fashion thing to do. And when they've been to that restaurant, they've been it, done it, got the T-shirt, and they're looking for another restaurant. So restaurateurs can feel that they're safe because it, they're full for the first six months, and then suddenly they lose their popularity. It is much more difficult, but I must say, I agree that, that um, Edinburgh has some wonderful restaurants. I don't know enough about Glasgow, but Edinburgh um, has absolutely, I mean, wh when John and I got married, which as I said was three years ago, we went to Ondine's, which was just opposite the, um, where we got married in the registry office. And it was a fantastic restaurant. It's, it's an oyster bar. And so I thought, all oh, good oysters. And John's eyes lit up because he knew more about oysters than I did. Do you understand that? <laughs> anyway, he, so, I, so they said to me, what do you want? And I said, well, I'll have oysters for my first course. And then they said, what do you want for your second course? course, and I said oysters. <laughs> so I had oysters, oysters, and treacle tart, <laughs> and custard. So <laughs> it wasn't perhaps the healthiest meal, <laughs> but it was absolutely <laughs> delicious, a lovely restaurant. And I've been going to Tom Kitchen ever since he first opened, mm. and we went last couple of weeks ago to one of his new ones, and they're just wonderful. I th I'm a great Tom Kitchen fan. Mm. Fantastic. We, we've got one over here first. Thank you. I think perhaps you may have just answered this, but I'm curious about um, a meal in your memory that will haunt you, sort of, whether it was something that was extremely sophisticated in its preparation or just very simple in a really interesting setting or something that you just will always remember those particular flavors. Well, well I'll tell you one thing. I, I've said this before, but, and it sounds so simple, but it taught me a really important lesson. When I was a student in Paris, I was queuing in a student um, canteen, and it was self-service. And in the refrigerated counters, they had, you know how the French have little dishes of salad for a first course. So there were a few beans on this plate and there was a little salad niçoise and there was various things. And there was a French boy um, ne next to me and I saw that there were three or four radishes, you know, the French breakfast type of radish, you know, pink ones with white tips. Um, and they had the leaves on them and there were f perhaps four of these um, radishes or maybe five. And there was a screw of salt and a pat of butter and these radishes. And I said to the boy next to me, kiss, 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 kiss. Oh, what, a, what on earth is that? That's not, a, that's not a first course. And he said, it's delicious. T t try it. And I thought, radishes, I'd only ever reluctantly had a radish in a salad or something. And he told, he, he sort of taught me how to scrape the radish through the butter, dip it in the salt, put it in your mouth, and it was unbelievably delicious. <laughs> and I, I mean, it was a lesson because I realized that that was really good butter. It was lovely mm. sea salt, which sort of s explodes in your tongue, on your tongue, and a really fresh la radish, so fresh that the leaves still looked wonderful. Mm. And I mean, that's, that's what, what, what matters in cooking is the quality of the ingredients. And I've, you know, that's 50, 
six, nearly 60 years ago. Mm. It is 60. Oh yeah. God, it is. <laughs> it is 60 <laughs> years ago. And I have remembered it. But it's still mm. true. Uh, one question there, and then... Who's... Oh, yeah, there's somebody. Do you have any advice on writing likeable characters? Where are straight, you? Straight in front of you, Prue. Thank you. Yes. Do so I have again? Do you have any advice on writing likeable book characters? I don't understand the question. Uh, uh, writing likeable book characters. Uh, any, so you've got any advice for writing, writing yes. them? I think, no, I don't really know, but I think that, I think that it's really important. And, and many writers wouldn't agree with me, but I think it's really important that the heroine or hero of your story should be, if not likeable, at least understandable, so that the reader has some empathy I mean, he or she could be a murderess, but you must understand why they're doing it. You have to go a bit deeper than just their deeds. And so, and if they're likable, people will stick with the book. If they're not likable, and I've done this many times as a reader, you think, I don't give a toss about any of these people, and you stop reading the book. You've got to care about them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you should think, for your, think in your own self what would what would I do and why would I do it? You know, I, I, I'm determined to murder this person, but <laughs> 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 whatever. Yeah, uh, we've got, I think probably just two more questions. We've got one there and then could somebody bring the mic down to the girl in the front row, please? Thank you. So up there first. If you wave um, wildly, I know where you are. But oh, we are over there, Prue. <laughs> otherwise, it's just, yes, there's wild, wild waving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just wondering, um, over the years sort of in the food industry, whether or not you or, or chefs that you've worked with have sort of uh, like felt your passion kind of dip for whatever reason and you feel a bit, a bit lost, a bit like you've kind of got out of flow or out of sync with what you used to find really interesting and exciting about working with food. And, and if so, how did you get around it? How did you find your passion again? That's a really interesting question. I've been really lucky because I've always worked for myself. And so I suppose that the point at which I might have become really depressed at doing the same thing over and over again as you have to in a restaurant, I might not have been in the kitchen by then. Sort of. so, but I think that there's a very interesting, there used to be a great French chef called Charles Barrier. And he influenced me a lot when I, I didn't know him, but I just used to read his books when I was very young. And he said, um, Good food, something like good food depends on the attitude of the chef. He said, peeling a carrot may be interesting. It depends on the attitude of the chef. And I think there's something in that, that there's something about doing f things really well that is very satisfying, whether it's peeling a carrot or making a cake or whatever. But I think it can be really depressing if you're tired. and. The sad things about my industry is that restaurants generally overwork their staff, underpay them, and the hours are ridiculously long. So that if you're tired and your feet ache, yeah, that's when we people quit the industry. And I don't know what the, what the answer is, because the obvious answer is we need to all pay more for food in restaurants. Because as long as there's this downward competition of trying to get, you know, um, three cookies course meal out for 25 pounds or something in a you know and produce really good fresh sustainable local blah 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 food something's got to go and what usually goes is the uh, the the chef's wages or the cook's wages usually the head chef's all right but everybody under him is struggling and then where do we get the ones in the future from mm. Mm. And the other thing that I think is an absolute tragedy is that I don't it's not happened so much in Scotland but in England, we no, no, no longer um, have any A-levels that have um, catering or mm. food technology. Everything stops at GCSE level. Mm. Well, if in the last two years of school you're doing no cooking, why would you think of a career in cooking? Mm. You wouldn't. Yeah. Scotland's better. One very quick final question, please. I'm turning 11 this Monday, and do you have any different... Um, Ideas for instead of a birthday cake or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you really like? Do you like ice cream? Kind of, yeah. Why don't you do a fridge cake 
which is really easy to do. You get good ice cream, or you make good ice cream, and you stack it up with biscuits in between. You have to keep the ice cream just at the right temperature so that you can spread it, but it's not um, runny. And you put it, get your favorite biscuits and stack it all up, build a castle or whatever it is you want to build. And it tastes fantastic because you get the cr crunchy biscuit and the ice cream. And I've never met a child who didn't like ice cream. <laughs> there you go. I think sadly that is the last question. So I want to thank you, the audience, for being so wonderful and enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. A big thank you to uh, Linda Duncan, who's <laughs> been a fantastic interpreter. Well done. Thank you. Can I talk too far? It's, I think it's a, it's a real skill, and we're very lucky here to, to, to have people like Linda. Um, Prue is going to be moving off, possibly not quickly, but moving, <laughs> to the Edinburgh Gin Cafe Bar signing tent, which is just next door. So if you don't mind giving us a minute or two just to get out, out the door, and then she'll be very happy to sign books. And so it just leaves me to thank um, Prue very much indeed for coming up here to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and for providing us with such an entertaining hour. Thank you very much, Prue. <laughs>